Hello, again, I'm Mary Lee and I'm with you for module number three on the immune system. The word immunity comes from a Latin word meaning free or untouched. The immune system is protecting us all the time. But first, let's look at the blood. The body weight of a human being is 7% blood. The average adult has five and a half liters or about one and a half gallons. The blood is composed of plasma, red blood cells, leukocytes or white blood cells, and platelets for coagulation. The blood moves nutrients such as glucose, amino acid, and fatty acids to all the tissues in the body. The blood supplies oxygen to the tissues and it removes waste. It detects antigens, coagulates, transport hormones, and regulates pH and temperature. The most important quality of blood is that, like water, it moves. It is contained in our veins and arteries and it is pumped by the heart. This is called circulation. White blood cells or leukocytes travel in the blood in the bloodstream. Lymphocytes are B cells, T cells, and macrophages. These attack viruses, cancer cells, and foreign proteins called antigens. There are also segmented neutrophils which attack bacteria and cancer cells. Basophils are responsible for histamine reactions to allergies. Eosinophils are active during parasitic infections or skin allergies. Monocytes are responsible for phagocytosis and the macrophages that consume unwanted enemies, antigen presentation and cytokine production. The immune system protects the body like a guardian from harmful influences from the environment as a, and is essential for survival. White blood cells develop from stem cells in the bone marrow and migrate via the bloodstream to the liver, spleen, thymus, and lymph fluid. Prior to 1975, we only had the information that we had a defense system called the white blood cells. But during that time, we discovered that there were T cells, and these T cells help with cellular immunity. T cells originate in the bone marrow, and they are transferred by the thymus gland. This knowledge has been imperative because HIV soon became prevalent. The autoimmune diseases like lupus and Sjogren's present when there is a defective T cell response. One of the more recent discoveries in immunology has been dendritic cells. Dendritic cells are called antigen presenting cells and they serve as a link between the two areas of the immune system, the adaptive and the innate systems. In this graphic you can see how the cells originate in the bone marrow. They have different ways of forming different cells in response to signaling proteins circulating in the bloodstream. These signals are determined by the varying environment of the tissues. Obviously, there are many details and many little proteins involved in the signaling of disease processes. In the immune system, there are adaptive and innate strategies. Within the adaptive immune component, there is cell-mediated immunity and humoral immunity. The humoral immunity involves B cells and produces specific plasma antibodies in response to specific antigens. This isolates the foreign protein or antigen at the site of infection. The phagocytes are signaled and the histamine release causes swelling and isolates the antigen. The size relationship of a phagocyte to the foreign antigen is like a semi-truck and a scooter. So it's not difficult for these macrophages to overcome foreign invaders. This usually creates reactions on the skin and you can see pus. The cell mediated component of the adaptive immunity is accomplished by T cells. They are activated by phagocytes, the signals to antigen specific cytotoxic T lymphocytes and this in turn activates cytokines, substances that we know as interleukins, interferons or growth factors. The adaptive component of the immune system creates immunological memory and after an initial response to a pathogen to subsequent encounters with that pathogen becomes more quick. This is the basis for vaccination. By constantly adapting and learning, the body can also fight against bacteria or viruses that change over time. The, the mal maladaptive reaction is when it reacts to self. This is called autoimmunity. The innate component of the immune system recruits at the site of infection, 
via cytokines. It then initiates a complement cascade to identify the invaders or waste. It also removes foreign substances and it acts as a physical barrier. These two immune components do not work independently of each other. They complement each other in a reaction to a pathogen or harmful substance, and they are closely connected with each other. The immune system is sophisticated and organized with elaborate modes of communication. So we're talking a little bit about the immune system, and we want to know some of the most important nutrients to keep your immune system strong. Vitamin C and zinc are two of the major immune-boosting nutrients. Zinc is available in many products, um, in meats, poultry, eggs, seeds and nuts, especially pumpkin seeds. And vitamin C is rich in citrus. All kinds of citrus fruit have lots of vitamin C. Other fruits have vitamin C as well. Bioflavonoids actually come from the inside of the peel. The white part is very rich in bioflavonoids. So when you're eating your citrus, be sure to eat all, all the parts of it besides the rind. Also, we have selenium, which is rich in Brazil nuts and other nuts. And those, in all these nutrients, vitamin C, zinc, and selenium, and bioflavonoids, will go together to make a very strong immune system. The strategies of the immune system utilize antibodies to target antigens or foreign proteins. Antibodies are Y-shaped glycoproteins called immunoglobins. The soluble immunoglobins are transported by blood and tissue fluids. There are also membrane-bound immunoglobins on the surface of B cells. This is a little graphic of the way antibodies are formed depending on the type of invader. A circulating white blood cell recognizes a foreign protein or a bacteria and initiates some activity from the helper T cell. And the B cell then divides and produces plasma and memory cells. The antibodies from the plasma cell activation attack the bacteria, which alerts the macrophages to eat all the foreign product proteins. The memory cell then remembers this attack, and next time the immune strategy will be faster. Immunoglobins which cross the placenta are called IgA. This confers immunity to disease from the mom to the unborn child. IgAs are found in the gut, respiratory tract, genitourinary tract, saliva, tears, and breast milk. IgE binds to antigens and triggers histamine, or allergy response. IgM is on the surface of B cells and eliminates pathogens. IgD is an antigen receptor on B cells. This little graphic shows the immunoglobins attacking the antigens when the B cell is activated. Let's look at the tissue components of the immune system. The white blood cells need many tissues and organs to function. The thymus gland is the promoter of T cells, and while the thymus gland does involute as we age, T cells are marked from birth and regenerate themselves. There is certainly more information to be gleaned in this area of research. Tonsils and adenoids identify invaders. Lymph glands are for storage and white blood cell production. Lymph plasma is circulated in the interstitial fluid, of which there is five times as much as blood. Recent research has found that the interstitium is like an organ unto itself. This is very interesting new research. Another component of the immune system is the spleen. It filters blood and distributes B and T cells. There is a white pulp or the outer part of the spleen that produces lymph, nonspecific hormone to increase neutrophil activity, and B and T C lymphocytes, which go to other lymph tissues. The red pulp or the inner part of the spleen removes bacteria, breaks down dying red blood cells, and recycles the iron. The red pulp of the spleen also produces phagocytic macrophages and granulocytes red blood cells for the fetus, and it is a reservoir for specialized leukocytes. The spleen can be ruptured by an injury to the upper left side of the abdomen. It is important to seek medical intervention if pain ensues from an injury to that area. Additionally, there is a condition called ITP, or idiopathic cytotoxic purpura, which is an autoimmune condition that affects the spleen and can cause severe bleeding. 
This condition is usually treated by surgically removing the spleen. It seems amazing that we can live without a spleen, but the only side effect is that you become more susceptible to infection. I think as we grasp more of the immune system, the more we will be able to treat autoimmunity. Other components of the immune system include the complement system, which are produced by hepatocytes in the liver. They are free-floating proteins activated by and working with antibodies, causing lysis or cell breakage and signaling phagocytes. The pyrus patches in the ileum are like lymph nodes. They contain B and T cells, macrophages and dendritic cells. As we've seen, the appendix can protect the good bacteria in the gut. As we know, the bone marrow is in charge of B cell production. The pancreas is in charge of surveillance, scavenging and producing enzymes. And it fights inflammation. Proteolytic enzymes secreted by the pancreas destroy and rebuild proteins, prevents and fights the bacterial and viral diseases. They assist in DNA repair, and they also digest proteins in the digestive tract. These enzymes participate in blood clotting and the activation of complement. These proteolytic enzymes are important in the reduction of inflammation inside of arteries and digest antibody antigen complexes that cause immune responses in muscles, joints, and glands. Pancreatic protease inhibitors stop the process of breaking down the proteins. It is important to note here that pharmaceuticals target the proteases that are produced by HIV infection, cancer, and other viruses. Foods rich in proteolytic enzymes and protease inhibitors are pineapples, papayas, figs, legumes, and seeds, rice, corn, sprouts, white and sweet potatoes, and chicken eggs. How do we experience the immune response? In an allergy, IgE is released in reaction to foreign substances. The immediate reaction following exposure is flu-like symptoms, rash, hives, and an elevated white blood count. There's also a reaction called energy, which means there's tolerance and therefore no symptoms or a delayed hypersensitivity. The reaction is not immediate, but it can be strong. And there's anaphylactic shock, a life-threatening reaction. The adrenal glands are suddenly overwhelmed by an unfamiliar antigen, and shock ensues due to the effect of epinephrine. Or there's something called food tolerance, usually caused by one of the seven most incompatible proteins, dairy, eggs, corn, wheat, chocolate, peanuts, and soy. This reaction is mediated by IgG. It's a delayed response, usually over 24 hours. The adverse effects are headaches and indigestion with gas, bloating, pallor, vomiting, eczema, fatigue, recurrent clothes, blurry vision, increased heart rate, and maybe even mood changes. Often we see people with dark circles under their eyes. I think of this as antibody antigen complexes in the kidney. Whether it is or is not, I'm not sure, but that's a sure way to tell that you're having a delayed food intolerance response. One of the simple ways to find out the specific allergen is to do a rotation or elimination diet. During four days, you will eliminate one of the most common incompatible proteins, let's say dairy. And then if you're feeling better after four days, you know that's the culprit. Otherwise, you go on to the next one and maybe avoid wheat and add the dairy back for four days and see how you do with all the other foods. If you're feeling much better, then you know it's wheat and you continue to do the process. Usually, you will need to avoid that offending food for a long time for IgG response to decline, but it's definitely a bonus for your immune system. Of course, there are treatments that it can aid in quieting these immune responses to foods and environmental factors. One of the ways that we can be healthy is to incorporate lots of anti-inflammatory foods into our diet. This is easy to do, and I like a flavorful salad with lots of different things in it. But green vegetables have um, anti-inflammatory agents in them, as well as uh, things like cranberries and red cabbage. 
Lots of greens are available now. You can use arugula, some spinach, some parsley. All of these are good. And then making a, a, a dressing with some olive oil and lemon. This is a wonder, olive oil is a wonderful anti-inflammatory. You can also add seeds and nuts, which in, increase the anti-inflammatory effect and things like strawberries and uh, raspberries. It seems unusual to put them in a salad, but I like lots of different things in a salad. So I use carrots and celery and cabbage and nuts and seeds to make a delicious salad full of anti-inflammatories. The inflammatory response occurs when tissues are injured by bacteria, trauma, toxins, heat, or other causes. The damaged cells release chemicals including histamine, bradykinin, and prostaglandins. These cause the blood vessels to leak fluid into the tissues, causing swelling and redness on the skin. Inflammation is a catabolic activity. It is protective and it increases the blood supply to the area. It also increases white blood cells which consume oxygen. This effect is protective because it cuts off oxygen to invading proteins. Inflammation creates pain primarily because of the swelling tissues and it's also a way to isolate things that shouldn't be in the body in the form of cysts, tumors, or boils. Additionally, there is increased cortisol and insulin production. Prostaglandins are numbered. Even numbered prostaglandins promote inflammatory response. Conversely, inflammatory response is turned off by odd numbered prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are produced in the essential fatty acid pathway. Omega-6 fatty acids become gamma-linoleic acid, rich in seed oils, which in turn form prostaglandins 1. But they also form arachidonic acid, even numbered prostaglandins and leukotrienes. Omega-3 produces EPA, rich in oily fish or chia, and that becomes prostaglandin 3 and DHA. It is these different ratios that are important to balance for low inflammation levels. So taking omega-6 helps reduce the inflammation caused by things like PMS, fibromyalgia, fibrocystic disease, arthritis, and even cancer. There is ongoing research in the optimum ratios, ratios of essential fatty acids, and we're sure to learn more about these important and essential molecules. In the meantime, protective measures for the immune system are vitamin A, C, E, and other antioxidants, balanced essential fatty acids, zinc, and vitamin B complex. I think it's key to understand that our there are immunologically advantages for breastfed children. The most important is the essential fatty acids, DHA and EFA, for brain development. It wasn't until 2001 that essential fatty acids were allowed to be added in infant formula. The best ratio is found in human breast milk. Breast milk provides passive immunity from the mother to the child and an antibacterial agent called lactoferrin. Other infection inhibitors, enzymes, hormones, and protective lipids. It also encourages bifidus factor, which activates intestinal flora and lots of growth factor. One simple way to encourage your immune system and to keep the lymphatic system circulating well is after every shower, use a nice nubby towel and rub the towel from the toes upwards toward the heart, from the fingers inwards toward the heart, and all around your shoulders and back upwards to the heart. This helps all the lymphatic system fluids to move and circulate well. A little inflammation is a good thing. It actually triggers the tissues to start to heal themselves. A lot of inflammation that becomes chronic can cause problems. Your body then experiences acid stress, oxidative stress, excessive free calcium, connective tissue breakdown, and anaerobic metabolism. These become deeper issues like cardiovascular disease, inflammatory bowel disease, renal disease, arthritis, pancreatitis, diabetes, cancer, and autoimmune diseases. Even deeper issues include bone marrow disorders like thymic lymphoplasia, lymphocytic leukemia, and multiple myeloma. 
Other immune disorders include reactions to viruses, hepatitis A, B, C, D, and E, herpes 1 and 2, autoimmune diseases, and HIV AIDS. Currently, there are some very exciting breakthrough treatments for many cancers. Cancer is a disease characterized by the development of abnormal cells that divide uncontrollably and have the ability to infiltrate and destroy normal body tissue. The main symptom of cancer is changes that persist. Macrophages are usually employed by the immune system to fight cancer cells. To prevent cancer, avoid caffeine, alcohol, polluted air, trans fatty acids, food additives, aspartame, saccharin, nitrosoimmunes in deli meats and, and other meats, barbecued meat, rancid foods, and low fiber diets. Thank you, and I look forward to being with you on the next module, number four, where we look at the genitourinary system and the endocrine system.